All right, Jim, I have some audio to play for you from the post AEW Double or Nothing press. And now, scrum. Barrett, now also, let's let the people know this was immediately after the pay per view. So, Tony Khan makes these guys after they've been in the building since noon, probably, and after they've had a five or six hour show, they got to go in and talk to Uncle Dave his sidekick, Brian, and three other people in an empty room for, what, two hours? Well, let's hear some audio. No, you didn't comment on that. Is anybody going to tell Tony Khan, Tony, we're not on the shit you're on. We don't have enough money to afford that shit. We got to go to bed once in a while. He knows that whatever he says will get out by the next morning and people will take the clips. Apparently, there was a big controversy. Some of the wrestling... Media personalities got upset because AEW wasn't going to allow people to film the press scrum or the media scrum and put it on their YouTube page. And when people realized they would lose a lot of revenue, they complained that Tony actually backed off so everyone could film it and put it on their page. Well, isn't that what a press scrum is for, to give the press photo ops and video ops and answer their questions and have them put that everywhere they possibly can? Because they're the fucking press! You would think so, but again, we're talking about the wrestling press. That's a whole different animal altogether. Yeah, boy, you ain't kidding. Let's get some audio. Here's Tony with CM Punk, who was the first person that sat down with Tony before the wrestling media. The question was about tension in the Adam Page promo on the go-home show before the pay-per-view, and if CM Punk is blending into the locker room. Let's hear this. Leading into double or nothing, how it felt like there was some real tension there. Um, do you feel like you're um, blending in with this locker room, or do you still feel like you're kind of somebody on the outside trying to find his way in to the regular mix of AEW? Uh, oh, I've I've grown so wise in my old age that I will I'll do my best to be uh, as diplomatic as I possibly can with this answer. Um, <laughs> If there's people backstage uh, that don't like me, it's a minority. And um, if anybody says that nobody wants me here and nobody likes me, I like to say that uh, nobody's don't like me and nobody's don't want me here. <laughs> so there's the first one I'm going to play well, for you. What do you think of that? I think uh, I'm sure all those nobodies know who they are, too. And that was that was very well well put. Uh, it, and I noticed Punk tries to be legitimate in these things. Everybody else just comes out and spills their guts. They'd be the worst fucking prisoner of wars ever. Not just name, rank, and serial number. They'll tell you everything they've ever done in their life and how they had these great ideas and how they could put their matches together and and just play with their friends and, oh, golly, what a show we put on. Whereas Punk tries to speak like he's in a sport and he's doing a, a press conference, you know, with legitimate press and doesn't destroy everybody's illusions. Again, he's on Gilligan's Island. He's, he's lost all alone somewhere in the sea of stupidity. Well, Jim, another one I want to play you here. This one got a little bit of attention. It's going to start with CM Punk mentioning how long the show went. But then someone asked about recent comments Eric Bischoff made looking for attention, trying to knock CM Punk. And CM Punk didn't have to say too much. Tony Khan came, I'm not even going to say rushing to his defense, just debunking how stupid an argument this was. Have you well, heard and, this? and remember also, because some people tried to stir it up. Oh, he's, he's knocking Cornette. But Punk said, ah, oh, these old fucking guys with the podcast, and blah, blah, blah. He was talking about Bischoff, which in the context... You understood, but everybody, oh, he's talking about Cornette, because nobody thinks about Bischoff. But no, he was talking about Bischoff. Did you hear Tony Khan's defense, or Tony Khan's reasoning, I, or what he said? I here? haven't heard Tony Khan say anything in a long time, and I have a feeling that's about to come to an end, because you're going to make me listen. Oh, yeah. Well, here it is, and like I said, a little bit of the question beforehand, and then into the Bischoff topic. Punk has been almost... I for years. sure got you guys blocked, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> pretty sure you got yeah, us blocked? I'm pretty, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty, pretty sure you got me blocked. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty I'm sure. positive. Yeah, okay. Especially after this question, you probably will like me even less. But... Um, <laughs> I haven't so, answered yet, so, you know. <laughs> so, it's been around nine years since you've been a uh, world champion somewhere else again. How do you feel? You seem a little tired, but 
Well, the we, show is like fucking twelve hours long. <laughs> you you're not, you're not tired. Come oh, on. I'm, I'm tired as hell. Y'all's you, match was like two hours. So, yeah, it was, it was great the, but my real question is, you had like a little bit of a Twitter war, not too long ago, with Eric Bischoff, where he, and I quote, he said that you were the biggest financial flop in wrestling. That's history. fucking bullshit. <laughs> Say, hey, I can tell. There's only one person that can attest to that. I don't know what other people. I can only attest what's happened here and public record and some of these things are a matter of public record because things of freedom of information and stuff so we do you know have over the years a good amount of financial data in pro wrestling i can tell you like no one wrestler has ever come in and made a bigger plus delta financial difference in the history of my company going into this is the third year anniversary this week mm -hmm. going into year four no one person has ever made a more positive impact we just did a record pay-per-view buy every pay-per-view he's done a four pay-per-view cycle now every one of them was the record this and uh whether it was all out where he was a huge part of the draw with darby whether and his debut of course is a huge thing from the first dance the biggest rampage draw in the history of that show uh the matches he carried the friday night war which by the way is a matter of record in fucking court in the state of california that we won the friday night war just ask jerry <laughs> mcdivitt because he fucking wrote it hey and this guy won it versus matt seidel who's a great wrestler he had another goddamn great match fucking on right, friday night I this won. fucking guy he fucking did the friday night war he did the first dance he's done the record double or nothing he did the record all out in his debut he did a, he was a big part of a record full gear a great match with eddie kingston and fucking a bunch of he wrestled a bunch of young guys a bunch of veterans in between there the what will Hobbs, Jesus. Daniel Garcia, God damn it. And then he showed up, uh, did the biggest program in terms of everything, TV, box, ever with MJF. And then he did the goddamn main event here. God He's the biggest it. part of financial success in Let's the history of this company. Go. Let's fucking go. Yeah, good answer. <laughs> Uh, I will I will quasi answer that. I didn't have a Twitter war with anybody. I never mentioned them my name and I think people like that just need to die in the dark and I don't I don't need to, to speak their name and stuff like that. I'm focused on what we're doing and the positives we bring uh, to the world and I don't want anybody to die. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but nevertheless. Oh. It is bullshit what he said. Yeah, uh, yeah, we, we don't need we don't need to, to everybody's got a shitty opinion, so just let them let them have it. That's a shitty opinion. It's the most bullshit opinion I've ever heard, and like I said, I hope the answer I gave get backed up why He's the opposite. He's actually for us the biggest financial success story. And okay, we're moving on. Thank we're you. Moving, right. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I just, <laughs> Punk had to shut him up. That's right. And there oh it is. Oh my god! <laughs> it, can you imagine Vince McMahon talking like that? And what? I mean, is it? What is it? <laughs> what? What is causing? Tony's hyperactivity. That's maybe the biggest mystery in wrestling right now. What is causing the hyperactivity? I don't know what to say about it. Just if, if he would go off for a question like that, like that, what if he got asked something stiff? What do you think would happen? I mean, and it was was Punk embarrassed there? You're seeing the the video. I'm only seeing the uh, hearing the audio. Punk had some interesting facial reactions, especially when Tony yelled out that he won the Friday Night War, which I completely forgot about. What? Jerry McDivitt declared it in court in California. What, what is he talking about? That the, uh, SmackDown does two million fucking viewers. What Friday Night War? When they moved it to Fox, was that when they moved it to Fox Sports? Did it go against? Rampage one night or when it was on a Saturday. There was some kind oh, of thing. Oh, yeah, yes. One time when SmackDown was on Fox Sports Net and Rampage was still a show that they were trying to give a shit about. Um, Yeah, they, they won like 100,000 people because there was a third of the normal WWE audience watching on the other network. But that that was a Friday Night War? I, the point is... It, is Tony losing it from the stress, or has he always been this way? As I mean, when I talked to him, he did go on quite a bit and at a high rate of speed and with not a lot of logic behind it. But that's isn't that embarrassing for the owner of the company? I don't know. And I always say that because traditionally I would have said, yeah, but... You know, in another respect, watching this and watching this guy immediately jump to the defense of his world champion who's sitting next to him with facts, just to point out that this is ridiculous, here are the reasons why. Yeah, I mean, it's a little, 
maybe over the top and how much he threw out there pretty quickly, but I think he's someone who tends to throw out a lot of stuff pretty quickly and his mind goes pretty fast. <laughs> but he defended his world champion and uh, kind of shut down the whole thing pretty quickly too. Well, I guess he's got that going for him, or going for him. But uh, I like too when Punk says they should die in darkness and Tony says, I don't want anyone to die. <laughs> <laughs> Well, another question for CM Punk, this one from Dave Meltzer. Oh, boy. Wanted to ask him about other people he wanted to work with. So let's hear this. But before that, Punk brings up what happened with the Buckshot Lariat. So let's go to this. After the match, you, you kind of made a, a joke, uh, kind of in jest and kind of not about uh, never doing another Buckshot Lariat. Yeah. Um, I mean, did, did, did you feel like when you did that, it was like, oh, my God, I made a mistake? Or was it just like... Oh, I'm sure you're not going to give me five stars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that's one, of the, that's one of those fucking things. I, um, that, those are the, those are, that's the only time that I've missed it since I've tried it. I did it on TV, and I just, I just, didn't, I just didn't hit it for whatever reason. And, it's, and it sucks, but, you know, that's the, that's the fun thing about pro wrestling is... I'm more comfortable when shit goes fucking sideways and not everything needs to look uh, perfect, in my opinion. Um, I'll probably beat myself up about it uh, way too much, uh, but, you know, uh, mistakes happen. So now, let me pause it there real quick, Jim. What are your thoughts on his reaction to Dave's question about the Buckshot Lariat? Well, I think that was a reasonable way to look at it. You know, it's not his specialty. It's something that he's been doing because of the program he's in, but he doesn't have the you know, years of experience doing it, and he probably ain't going to do it anymore, but he ain't going to dwell on it. He did, It's not like he fucking landed on his head and was carted off to the hospital. He landed on his feet and fell back. But like I said, it, it was noticeable the second time. I don't know if I would have gone for the second one or not, but I guess they had to to do what they wanted to do. Let's go back to this. Dave asking Punk about guys he wants to work with. Let's hear if this jibes with who you think he should work with. Now, going forward as champion, um... Are there any names that you're looking forward to more than others? I mean, there's a list of 30 guys yeah. or more that mm -hmm. you could go right through. But is there anyone that you're going like right now, whether it's whoever it is, that you're really looking forward to going against next? Oh, um, well, obviously, we got Forbidden Door coming up. So, you know, to me, focusing on that, um, I think Okada... Uh, Tanahashi, Osprey, guys like that. I'm looking forward to stepping in the ring with um, AEW talent. Um, I always think number one with a bullet is going to be Brian Danielson. Um, I've never wrestled John Moxley. I wrestled Dean Ambrose, so that's that's an interesting that's an interesting matchup. There's still guys on on my list that I've never wrestled. There's Jungle Boy, uh, Ricky Starks. Um, I could probably finish out my career wrestling uh, FTR like every day for the rest of my life. And <laughs> it could be different and, and fun every single time. Um, Will Hobbs is another guy that I, I, I think has all the potential in the world. We got a really stacked roster. It's, it's, almost, it's almost a crime that we can't do everybody justice at once. But I think we're getting there with baby steps. And I think we're learning. Um, I think we may make mistakes, you know, but instead of, you know, dwelling on it and punishing other people or ourselves, I, I think we, we move on and we just, you know, try to learn from things. Uh, but Brian Danielson would probably be the first guy that, that comes to mind. Very selfishly, I'd love to wrestle him again. Let me get your thoughts on that answer, Jim. And of course, there are some notable names he did not list. Well, first of all, I mean, he, like everybody else in the business and that has any experience, knows what they're doing, knows that Dax and Cash are the two best workers in the company, so he'd love to work with them every day for the rest of his life. Uh, he mentioned the top Japanese guys, and that's I could give two shits and a whistle whether I ever see any of those matches or not, because I don't care. But I would love to see Punk and Danielson. You know, it, 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 he was nice enough to say, oh, there's 30 guys, but he could only name a few, and there's and there's really... God damn, who do you, I mean, there's guys that you could want to see Punk wrestle because he will have a good match with them and he will elevate them and they might come out, you know, looking better than they did before. But of the actual alleged main event guys in the company right now, who's in line for a title shot and who 
could be put in line very quickly for a title shot against CM Punk. Everybody else is involved in shit. Everybody wins as much as they lose, lose as much as they win. Is there a clear person besides the thought is in everybody's mind is Danielson because he's so fucking good. Who else would it be that would draw any money? Well, they just had Danielson lose to Jericho, so obviously they're setting him up for the world title, clearly. Well, yeah, and, and, yeah, and also, and that's another thing. By the time he gets to Punk, he's been beat by Jericho in a garbage match for no reason. But notice Punk didn't say Jericho. He didn't even say Omega. He had a very well, interesting he? list he, of guys he wants to He wants to draw money and have good matches. He doesn't want to have his popularity sapped by a chameleon, nor does he want to get into interpretive ballet. No, the other name I was listening to here, if he would say, would be Samoa Joe. Because that's still one of the ones, even though they booked Joe like shit well, so far, yeah. it's one of the ones I'm still intrigued to see after all these years. That would be interesting. Also, and maybe he just, you know, unfortunately, maybe he's just watching the TV and going, well, Joe's nowhere near ready for this. And oh, by the way, he just lost earlier. And I don't mean Joe's not ready talent-wise. I mean, the way they booked him, right. the way they presented right. him. And then they just beat him earlier with a goddamn small child. So anyway, I, I, I can see why he might not have brought Joe's name into that. Well, the next bit of audio I want to play for you is Tony Khan by himself before Chris Jericho came in talking about what we talked about earlier, the NBA, the percentages for Game 7, and as Jace put here in the notes... Just rambling and getting wide-eyed and more bombastic. So <laughs> let's play a little bit of this, but it'll get into some of what we said was Tony's strategy and some of his thoughts about the length of the card and how the card went. It's a great night, guys. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I'll get to catch you after Chris comes in. We can catch up at length, too. It's been, it's been a real special night. Just before Chris comes in, some notes I'll drop that are interesting. So this is the record for Double or Nothing. All four, all of our pay-per-views continue the streak. All of the pay-per-view franchises have been up year over year. All out, every all out's been higher than the year before. Every full gear's been higher than the year before. Every revolution. Lots of things are higher than they were last year. <laughs> 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 And uh, in part due to all of you, and I'll just say that again at the end, but I really appreciate you all being here and disseminating and helping build uh, interest among the fans for this. Uh, if you don't know, I talked about it with other media during the week. Is Chris coming in? By the way, I'm ready. I'm Chris. Whenever you're ready. Whenever you're ready. Okay. And uh, just to, I'll, I'll drop the stat again maybe later, but it looked increasingly likely that there might be a game seven this this week and when we planned had i gone saturday it was actually more likely that the warriors would have played because the warriors would have been game six and a game six is far more likely than a game seven and actually there was only a 28.1 percent chance of a game seven so but as the series the was going on 28.1 percent chance so about 72 percent of the time you're not going to get it so i was playing the odds when i booked this it looked like the game seven was less likely and we've always done better on pay-per-view on sundays especially with a holiday week and memorial day so with a 28 percent chance i thought we had a pretty good chance as the series went on i was like oh gosh so i came up with a plan uh <laughs> that i think worked really well and uh, the person in here is a big part of it because the last three matches were the hottest three matches of the night arguably at the end of a show that because i pushed the buy-in to a later start uh, you know, and, and tried to make sure we had really special stuff with Anarchy in the arena. And of course the world tag title and then the world championship matches at the end of the night, we saw record buys and we did get late buys, which was part of the strategy because I thought people would know the game's over and there's still, Hey, there's fans gathered at home, friends gathered, families gathered watching sports. Hey, what the heck? These matches are on. And then Anarchy in the arena gets going. People hear it's nuts. Tell your friends, oh tell your world tag title. Is that a thing? Do people get stuff. together as a family to watch the NBA finals? How many people get together with their friends? You may have their friends come over. I've done that. He's for talking business. about the family. You got all your kids. You got the dog there. Hey, NBA. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. It's just like the Wizard of Oz is annual airing on television. Go ahead. Play me more of people on Twitter are calling Tony Khan either Tony Yayo, the cocaine cowboy, or Herb Abrams Jr. I don't think it was Coke, but let's go back to this. If you missed a lot of the favorite, whenever Chris comes in, I'm ready to, I can answer this later, but you know, a lot of my favorite pay-per-views are like 13, 14, and they're great to rewatch. Like God, how many times have I watched uh, WrestleMania 17, which is like 13 matches. How many times now they're a little bit shorter. And now some of the 12, 13, matches, <laughs> <laughs> which I think Chris could, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, you know, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I think people are going to watch it over and over again. It was a big success for us commercially. And I think the fans at the end proved it was it was uh, the right move, uh, holding stuff out, holding hot stuff, and uh, 
commercially a success, and I, I heard a lot of you like the matches a lot, and the stuff at the end uh, got the response we were hoping for, and I think the whole show was great. Um, and I, uh, do you guys have Chris? Champs and then Blade Champion, the first champion, uh, coming back to where we did this for the first time. It's a different building, but it's cool to be back here. And uh, after Chris is here, I'll stay with you guys until you get all your stuff answered and talk to you. But it's really a, a very special, uh, crazy day. And uh, I, like I said, I put stuff in later in the week, knowing uh, that as the series went on, it was like, okay, this is going to happen. I'm going to stack the card up. And I felt like starting later, it was about revolution. It was probably similar bell to bell time because the revolution, the buy-in started near the top of the hour. And we went with that Leyland Statlander at a very good match. And then later the house of black had a good match. I mean, the hook matches were, you know, it would have been like if we kept the hook match and pushed those other matches into the pay-per-view with the West coast start. So it was actually probably a very similar bell to bell time. Oh my God. Started. But I think it got more into the pay-per-view window and that's, I've talked to Dana and, and Hunter and the people at UFC. I mean, I think Dana runs the best business in sports pay-per-view probably history and certainly the most consistent winner. And they put on long pay-per-views. I mean, punk and hangman went into the ring far earlier than any UFC main event or big boxing main event in this town. And uh, I was here in, in, not here, I was in the MGM Grand 10 years ago when Pacquiao and Bradley fought. And you, I mean, they didn't, they smartly held back because, and think about it, look, like, it's no secret to the sponsor of the show. The Does anybody have Chris? It, and they <laughs> were not, we advertised that people had an action. And I think they saw the most of any of the matches we promoted through them. And he doesn't that, blink too, to have like people get out of the heat Celtics game and then be able to go back because the title sponsored the company. That's like the biggest sponsor we have right now. And they happen to work with UFC and other big companies. Uh, like, you know, with what they've done, I think it made sense to get out of the heat Celtics game for them. And, uh, speaking of a guy that, uh, ended this with the hottest last three matches I think we've ever done on any pay-per-view and, and was a huge part of why this is a huge night and one of the best things we've ever done. He's been big from the beginning. <laughs> uh, let me pause it right there. He gets oh up to hug God. Chris Jericho. Does he ever admit when anything is the shits? Or is has he got people believing that everything they do is good? Everything I hear, oh, it's the greatest thing we've ever done. Even the shit that obviously sucked pond water. And then the only time he's admitted anything is the shit is when Big Swole clapped back at him and then he said, listen to this. Eve, remember they even had a fucking excuse for when the ring didn't blow up. Oh, it was the heel that did it. or what? I. <laughs> That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. He's, I'm very, just, he's passionate. He's very passionate about he's, this. Yeah, he's passionate and he's a nervous wreck and somebody needs to put him in a rubber room at the puzzle factory before he hurts himself in some fashion. I'm going to try to find here some audio of Chris Jericho. Oh, seriously? Here's Chris Jericho. Let me go to this. What, did, what could he have had to say for himself after that abomination that he took part in? Let's go to this. I believe this is about the anarchy in the arena extravaganza. Uh, we had to record the whole thing in an empty stadium, obviously. Then last year was kind of a combination of the stadium stampede and then a live, uh, the finish was in the live arena. So when we were talking about what are we going to do this time, we thought about a couple different things, a couple different names, and then we just said let's make it kind of a stadium stampede but in the live arena. I was standing in the back. We were standing in the back in the arena, and literally I said, like, well, arena anarchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, shit. Anarchy well, then you ended up going to anarchy in the arena. Yeah. It was better, but it was just like we were looking. Uh. It was a great choice. Yeah, we wanted to do something with that spirit but transpose it into the live arena. Now, a street fight is a street fight, but we said what, let's just go completely over the top and also keeping in mind that we have 10 people and only so many cameras and we got to keep it where the fans can kind of still see what's going on so lost that I fight was <laughs> we came here on thursday and just started talking about it and that's when i started thinking like okay this is going to be really cool and then being out there and feeling it, i think people really enjoyed it and i think the where he placed where tony placed it in the show was very smart because it was the right place to kind of put the money mark over the last you know third of, of the whole show let me stop it there for a second. You say Tony Khan can't admit if anything's wrong. He does a better job of that than Chris Jericho. Chris Jericho thinks every idea he has is a great idea, and Tony well, Khan and not nods only along. That, not only that, but here's the... And by the way, Chris, I washed my hands of you a while back for being a Trump-sucking religious nut, but now you can't even 
have any integrity about the wrestling business. You're just like the rest of these jack offs. You got to go, Oh, we had this idea and we all talked about it together. And we sat down and we came up with all these cool things to do in this fake shit that we do for all of you. And what a performance. And it's all my idea, but it was all fake too. And it just, it, fuck it. They've all lost their fucking minds. And if they ever do accidentally have a match that people kind of halfway believe and it looks somewhat professionally done, they'll still go out there and talk about how they came up with all these entertaining things to fake do for the people's entertainment. Can you imagine Vince McMahon and or Steve Austin and or The Rock and or The Undertaker sitting down there telling the fans how fake the show that they just put on was? Or would you think that they are not so egotistical that they have to let everybody know that it was their idea, even when it sucked, and they just let the fucking thing draw money on its own? But that's professionals instead of egotists and amateurs. I'm disgusted by everybody involved. Sure. Because of the way this match was went and everything like this, do you think this can be like one of your company signature matches, like where you do it once a year or every 18 months or, you know, something you go back to as like kind of one of your regular? I think it's events? a more sustainable solution than Stadium Stampede. Yeah. I think we like Chris is the master of reinvention. And I think like once again, like putting heads together and with like Chris's great mind, we like reinvented Dunk. and did something. And now we have anarchy in the arena. And, you know, we, we, were, we were very proud of Stadium Stampede. People, we said like we were originally thinking maybe we should call it that, but it's a new version of it. But then we said that that was a product of its time. Maybe we'll revisit it. But now we can do an anarchy in the arena whenever the time is right, no matter what time of the, of the year it is. Oh, good God. Thank you. Um, my favorite part of the match is the song playing through most of the match. That was Thank his you. favorite part. Who is this fucking weasel speaking? I'm not exactly sure, but by the way, what journalist begins their question, but my favorite part was this. Yes, my, my favorite part of the coup of the government in El Salvador was when they came out and played the record. And then whose idea was to kill it? So I point. think when we were talking about it originally, we were kind of like... Um, Harkening back to New Jack when his music would play throughout his matches, which kind of took away the fact that there was just basically plunder and just garbage. Which going took on. away the fact that but it was music- a garbage match with nothing going on. Added some excitement to it. So we thought, okay, so if we can play the music for the first like third of the match, that will kind of sustain it to where people see like it's just kind of basic. Well, not the thing was basic, but just kind of like until we get to some of these bigger moments, I think because no one's ever done that here in AW or anywhere mm. since then, it's kind of uh, it kind of makes it seem different. It makes it different. And then I thought, well, this is great, and I'll be the you know the, the party pooper who hates this song, and well, let's break the soundboard. So let's put a, a soundboard thing up there, and we'll break it. And that was my favorite part too. Like as soon as we hit the ground, it goes off. And like I was telling Tony, I was like, I love wrestling. <laughs> I, st- I still love oh my for God. moments like this. Yes, it's comic, but it's it's like the asshole heel just hates music. And it's like, I'm going to smash this. No, we were all screaming, stop that, that kind of fucking music. To to you did us a favor. You fucking, so I, kind of- die, die. I hope you die. I hope you die, you motherfuckers. <laughs> you don't love wrestling. You hate wrestling. You shit in wrestling's face. What else did he have to say? Uh, let me uh, go forward a little bit more, but. There are his general thoughts on anarchy. I also like the idea that we're supposed to think Jericho's an old curmudgeon who hates music. That's how we were supposed to take that? I don't know what the fuck they're thinking about. And again, if they did get anybody, any simpleton that would believe their logic bereft, nonsensical fucking wrestling matches, then they'll come out and spoil it for that one knucklehead By telling him it was all fake, too. What in the world have we come to here where you go out and legitimately try to hurt yourself and other people and then tell everybody afterwards it was all fucking bunch of bullshit? Well, Jericho, I got another question later on from Brian Alvarez asking about Jericho's amazing ability to get things over and reinvent himself and his many (sighs) ideas. Brian Alvarez. Hey, buddy. I'm I'm intrigued at your ability to get things over. <laughs> your career. And uh, 
I've noticed that like Brian Danielson will come up with an idea of something that he wants to get over. Like he saw the yes thing from uh Right. Yes. And but it seems to me that you will do something <laughs> and then you will see that there's an ability to get that over. Like when the belt got stolen, and you did the promo in the hot tub, and you mentioned the bubbly. I don't think that you, at the time, and you can correct me. No, there was no bubbly, yeah. Yeah, I don't. Th- well, I don't think you had the idea that I'm going to get over this phrase, the bubbly. Right. But you saw that it got over, and then you went with it. Mm. So how would you... I just kind of want to know the way that your mind works. Would you say that the majority of the things that you get over, the list, the bubbly... <laughs> I mean, you can go throughout your career. Were these things that you, I, I'm going to get this list over. I'm going to get this bubbly over. Like, is it kind of like a Danielson thing where you have it's, this idea of something you want to get over? Or are most of your ideas, something happens and you just think, man, I can it. go with this. I think one thing that I'm pretty good at is just reading the room. <laughs> oh. Hold on, hold on, I'm stopping it there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. One of Jericho's top talents, reading the room. My God, I just can't. Do all of the journalists, all six of them that come into this room, do they bring their own baby oil for these hand jobs or are they given a a bottle of baby oil when they come in? I will say from watching this last night, it does appear that a lot of people are there as fans who have a place where they write about wrestling as opposed to people who consider this something to be treated seriously. When you begin by saying what your favorite matches were, or I like this or that, I'm not exactly sure if that's how it's supposed to go. But It's it's, it's not a hostile room. No, not at all, and especially not for Chris Jericho, but let's go back to his brilliant answer. Um, Because I've had a lot of things, like, where, like, I I thought, like, GFY, that's a good one. And then the same (laughs) night, Mox came out and literally said, go fuck yourself, and I was like, well, that one's done. (laughs) Um, But no one was really getting into it. You're kind of swimming upstream. But for example, like like the wizard, for example, all it was was throwing the fireball. I'm a wizard, and I start seeing people like, okay, they're making gifts of Chris Jericho with a Gandalf, and Chris Jericho's face on Gandalf, or oh like boy. all these cartoons or Dragon Ball Z, and it's like, oh, this this is interesting. <laughs> they put, they, they, they put like this Jericho's wizard. So face on Gandalf's times, body. Would anybody have noticed? <laughs> Uh, you're interrupting right, the genius. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking wizard. genius. Yeah. And then little kids now, they're supposing videos. So what, are you, what are you? I'm a wizard. Oh, <laughs> now we have something. Oh, so that's why we did the fireball last week. Just Harry Potter has guy, nothing to do with that. You don't have to do it much, but just doing it a second time, now it's Chris Jericho's. I'm a wizard. My dad said, how did you do that fireball? I said, I'm a wizard. I'm a wizard, dad. He's like, well, dude, do you want one? It's in my hands. So <clears throat> that's kind of what you just read the room. And kind of see, like, people don't bring signs anymore. You notice that? Yeah. I noticed that a, a couple of weeks ago. Nobody brings, back in the day, signs everywhere. That's how you could tell. Jimmy Hart would always say, you can't make people write You know signs. why? You know it's hard? Why? You can't hold your sign in your phone. Good call. Same time. That's a good point. Good point. <laughs> Everyone's always got their phone in so their So you used to be able to read the signs. That is a good point. And now what you do is read social media. And you see kind of what's moving and what's shaking. And then, you know, we maybe put out a t-shirt, see how it does. Oh, it's the number one seller of the week. Okay, now we have something. So I think it's basically just reading reading the climate of the room and kind of hearing what people do and just that I'm, I'm pretty good at that. And instinct, instinct is good as well. A lot of, I mean, 32 years of doing this, I have a real kind of good feel as to what people are into or what they might be into. And most of the time I'm right. Not all the time, but most of the time I'm right. Even Jericho Appreciation Society, when I told Tony that one, he bit on it right away. He, he, and I was like, dude, he's like, oh, he bit like, on it. <laughs> when I first said that, huge outrage. Jericho Appreciation, that's terrible. It's terrible. I was like, okay, stop. I'm in charge. You should have called the Inner Circle 2.0. Right? No, 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 no. I love that's it. terrible. And then here we are now, Jericho And the Appreci- sports entertainment. And the sports entertainment. I leaned into the sports entertainment as soon as you said it. Oh, what a genius. Right. What a genius. And it leaned so perfect into Brian Danielson, Mox. Well, that was another thing, too. To quick, I'm sorry I'm telling. I know you guys have been here a long time. No, it's great. But, they love so it. we were in Bridgeport, and Eddie Kingston and I had a face-to-face promo. And he was great because he came in there and said, you know, I don't even know why I'm here. I don't want to talk. This is pro wrestling. You want sports entertainment? Go down the road. Huge reaction. Oh, that's interesting. They don't like sports entertaining they don't like sports entertainer who knew hmm who could have figured this guy? out yes you weird question is sports entertainer trademarked nope is now so that's kind of why i was like it's perfect and then the, the, like like he just said with the blackpool combat club and then suddenly they're connected because of eddie and mox and none of you guys saw it coming which made me laugh so hard 
all the smart minds in the room. Nobody saw this. It's five on three. It's five on three. Okay, it's getting old. These guys got to do something. Blackpool Combat Club. Oh, it's getting old. They're going to do something. You never saw the connection that it was coming to a head? We came up with that three months prior. But it's like I said, it all connects. Everybody <laughs> yes, connects. we plan everything uh, out ahead of time, ladies and gentlemen, because we're all a bunch of fucking phonies. Can you cut this motherfucker off? He has become right. Kenny Omega. If you hear the way he talks yes, about himself, he's, he's even doing stuff. the breathy phone sex voice. Yeah. He's an art artist. And well, I guess, cause, you know, that'll be the next thing. He'll try to fucking be Twinkle Toes 2.0 and sap some of his fans if he's got any left. Uh, my God, my God, my And what stunning revelation is it that wrestling fans hate sports entertainment? Wrestling fans have hated sports entertainment ever since Vince came up with the idea. And we continue to talk about that. And that's why that uh, so many people were insulted by and, and incensed by AEW because we were promised our sports-based wrestling and we got outlaw bullshit just a different kind of outlaw bullshit than we get over in the wwe but it's still outlaw bullshit there ain't no sports in any of this entertainment and they lied at least vince said flat out no we're not going to give you good fucking violent bloody fucking pro wrestling that you can believe we're going to give you a bunch of horse shit so you'll buy ice cream bars but Tony lied to us. No, we're not going to do that. Sports-based presentation with middle schoolers and legless people and Rick Knox, the fucking floating corpse referee. And phony shit that we think about three months ahead of time. And then we'll tell you about it. Why do they? Nobody watches this shit anymore. And everybody wonders why. Well, one uh, last thing before we end the media scrum audio, at least one last thing. Here is, rather briefly, Tony Khan on the MJF situation. Uh, Tony, Nick Hausen with Wrestling Inc. Yeah, Nick, what's up, buddy? Uh, I'll ask you what literally everybody wants me to ask you, which is, from your perspective, what happened with MJF this weekend? I'm not going to comment on that, uh, but I've got a lot of stuff on the pay-per-view I can comment on, but I'm not going to comment on that. All right, well, <laughs> What do you think of his answer there? Um, again, who knows? Who knows with this? If I, if I had to bet, I would say that MJF has figured that I can't let Tony Khan in on wh what I'm doing because he'll spoil it all and tell everybody I'm fake. So he's gone into business for himself because he's the only one with a fucking brain and he's creating more attention about and around himself than ever before, including... He stole the pay-per-view, but it was petty theft. So I'm pretty sure that probably Tony does. I don't know what to say because I'm going to look like an idiot because I don't know what's going to happen. If he's mad at MJF, then whatever MJF is doing is probably working because since Tony can't work, he's got to be mad to carry it off or else why is he just says nothing because he don't know what to say. I don't know, but I have... I have all the faith in the world that MJF will get as much attention as humanly possible out of this. I don't have any faith in anybody else being involved in it or a part of it, because elsewise, then it'll go south, because everybody else is an amateur. Jim, let me play one last bit of audio, because this ties oh, into what we asked about earlier, and I'm going to probably have to cut this off, because I think it just goes and goes, so I will stop it at some point. But Tony Khan talking about the length of the show. <laughs> follow up with something maybe you will comment on is as punk alluded to uh it's a longer than average show i had a lot of people hitting me up saying they felt fatigued especially on the east coast where the show ended after midnight is this the kind of length of show you're gonna continue to put out i will forward? follow the feedback of the fans it was pretty similar revolution and had great response and commercially the show was very successful like i said before uh chris came in i was starting to say there was it was a little bit different and i ended up uh, adding a little bit to the length of the show to help the show commercially and help the show make money and i think it made uh if not a seven figure difference definitely a six figure difference in the bottom line of the show and so that's a big consideration, certainly, and a major financial consideration when Game 7. Like I said, it was probably only a 28% chance of the Game 7. It was far more likely. 
if I'd booked the show Saturday that there would have been a game and it would have been the Warriors who were a big draw. And uh, so the game seven only happens 28.1% of the time. 72% of the time, this would have been a pretty easy thing. And on the West Coast, I probably would have ended it around the time they always end. Every pay-per-view has ended between the same time until tonight. They've all ended. And we've had a lot of the best pay-per-views anybody's done. They've all ended between uh, 11.40 and 11.55-ish. Uh, let me, yes, like, every single goddamn one's seven, been too long, uh, on the East you fucking Coast, which is like brain moron. Dave. So this is about the same amount of wrestling bell-to-bell -bell as the revolution. The difference is, I was starting to say, Layla and Chris Statlander had a long, great match before Layla got hurt uh, on the first match of the buy-in in, in Orlando, which was on the East Coast for Christ. the fans. And I think, I thought the fans were far more, uh, like, I, like, from that I learned, probably better to put the stuff in the pay-per-view. I thought the crowd, this was the best... If people were fatigued at home, I'm sorry because I never intended it to be that way. But it was the best <laughs> the fans in the arena have ever reacted for the last three matches of any pay per view we've ever done, Nick. And I've done 13 of them now. And plus, oh the golly, fight for the Fallen Fighter Fest, which were, we were free, but um, they were free domestically. I think they were still international pay per views, but I think our overall international gets a good deal on pay per view prices. So uh, I think what um, in the world. I'm going to stop it there. He yeah. is he's God. flying high, and I don't think it's Coke. I know my Coke heads. I don't think it's Coke. I, I, I This is what you've got. You've got this guy who is a, obviously a savant, let's say, one of those savant types with numbers. Of course, he fucked up there. 28.1% chance. It doesn't equal a 72% chance on the other side. It's 71.9. But nevertheless, around that Scott Steiner math promo, this guy's a basket case, and he, he's an amateur, and he's got a bunch of money, and nobody will tell him he's got no clothes on, and everybody puts over his great ideas, and he puts over their great ideas, and meanwhile, they're milking him for fucking hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars. And this whole thing has the direction of a goddamn boulder rolling down a fucking cliff. Here's a question for you. This is an hour and eight minutes into a two hour and 14 minute media scrum following the pay-per-view event. Oh, damn it. They can't stop, can they? So this ended around 3 a.m. on the East Coast, a little after 3 a.m. on the East Coast. There's an hour left in this, more than an hour, we're not going to listen to. If I randomly picked a moment to drop the needle on, a, do you think Tony's talking? And B, what do you think he's talking about? He's talking about his greatness and his great ideas and his pay-per-view buy rates, and he's definitely talking. All right, I'm going to try this now. Here's 117.44. Nothing staying in Vegas forever, and I think they showed why. They uh, Here's another one. Going back to that and how busy I was around that time. We're getting ready for the NFL draft. So, uh, and <laughs> uh, so it was, it's, a, it's a lot, but... Um, I never heard this story. They only allowed ten people in the entire amphitheater as a fire. So it was what? It was Tony Schiavone at the desk? I was the only person backstage. They said the truck is a separate domicile. Let me stop this for a second. He's talking about the pandemic era shows, the very first ones. They were at only three o'clock in the morning. They were only allowed ten people there. Yeah, this is the kind of things people talk about at media scrums at three in the morning. So, so Greg, you were out in the truck. There were ten of you in the truck. We had a, I set up a trailer of wrestlers. And, uh, and you know, killing it. And I remember Dr. Martha Hart and her family, Oge Hart and Athena Hart. It was, I think, one of the most successful shows Ring of Honor had done. And also a big, I really appreciate you asking that because I flew out to London uh, on uh, British Airways. And then I flew back to Atlanta. With Austin, I was up there, and that's how I made the connection. All right, there it is, Tony Khan. If Have you a... play one more quote from <laughs> Tony Khan, I'm going to sue you, you son of a bitch. You're going to sue me? I know just the man you can call. Well, then play his music and get him in here. Call Steven P. Show or two. And folks, I'll tell you what, if you have purchased something that will never end, no matter how much you want it to, it goes on and on and on forever. 
And it's not indeed what you thought you were purchasing, but instead indeed what you got foisted off on you. You need legal recourse. Not only that, but if somebody has fired you wrongfully, has assaulted you wrongfully, is there a right way to assault somebody? If somebody has stolen something from you or in other ways harmed you or your immediate family, one of the greatest personal injury attorneys, one of the greatest attorneys in general, one of the greatest human beings on the face of the planet is indeed, and I'm talking about this planet, Earth, not even one of those that don't have so many people on it. Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. He's a philanthropist. He is philanthropist of most people in the state of West Virginia, and now he's branching out where he'll philanthrop people in your home state. He gives money to kids for sports. He supports the arts. He gives money to homeless people, and he feeds the hungry, and he's also gotten nearly $100 million in judgments for people just like you, the, the, the rank-and-file American who has been put upon and downtrodden and had something go on that they needed somebody to fight for them and be on their side. And that's what he's done. Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. And as we've heard from so many of the testimonials of the cult of Cornette, not only does he stay awake at 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning watching bad wrestling and answering the phone, but he'll get back to you. And if he can't get you out of the predicament you're in, he might know somebody who can. So for all those reasons and many more, we must support the consigliere of the cult of Cornette, Stephen P. New. Get even with Stephen. If you need to sue, call Stephen P. New.